Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, I'm Nicholas Gordon, host of the Asian Review of Books podcast, done in collaboration with the New Books Network. In this podcast, we interview fiction and nonfiction authors working in, around, and about the Asia-Pacific region. Globalization is possibly the most important economic phenomenon of the past several decades. Opening borders, increasing trade, and deepening integration has transformed our economies, our societies, and our politics. Globalization has changed what the establishment supports. The reaction against globalization has transformed those standing against the establishment. But there's a world of difference between Donald Trump's and Bernie Sanders' critiques of globalization. And those who have concerns about it do so for different region, reasons, building different alliances as they work to implement, reform, or roll back globalization. Anthea Roberts and Nicholas Lamp, authors of Six Faces of Globalization, Who Wins, Who Loses, and Why It Matters, published by Harvard University Press, looks more closely at these debates, building out distinct narratives that classify how we should think about the politics of globalization and how different political movements understand who wins from the phenomenon. Everyone, a few, or nobody at all. Anthea Roberts is professor in the School of Regulation and Global Governance at Australia National University and author of the, of the prize winning is International Law International. Nicholas Lamp is associate professor in the Faculty of Law at Queen's University, Ontario. Before joining Queen's University, he worked as a dispute settlement lawyer at the World Trade Organization. Today, Anthea, Nicholas, and I will talk about the politics of globalization, the arguments used to support it, and the stories used to criticize it. We'll explore some of the interesting intersections between these arguments and where we think the politics of globalization might go from here. So thank you to the both of you for joining me on the Asian Review of Books podcast. Perhaps let's kind of start with setting the scene a bit. Um, you know, globalization, I think, in the 90s, maybe early 2000s, was seen as very much an inevitable economic phenomenon. You had all these politicians come out and say, uh, it's inevitable, it'll definitely happen. Um, everyone at least appear to be uh, with the program, let's say. But now, of course, it's much more contested. There's lots more. Uh, it seems like there's a lot more reaction to it, a lot more political movements against it. it yes, they were always there, but now they seem um, a lot more, you know, quote unquote, mainstream. So I guess kind of to start when it comes to the politics of globalization, uh, what happened and why do they seem more contested now than they have in the past? Yeah, um, so there have always been protests against uh, globalization. We had, of course, in 1999, the famous uh, Battle of Seattle. But I think the point at which criticism of globalization went mainstream was around the 2015-2016 mark. So in Europe, you had these um, massive protests against trade agreements that were being discussed at the time between the European Union and uh, the United States. And then, of course, in 2016, you had the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump. And so that was really the, the moment at which we felt that, that, the ground, that the ground was shifting, that this old establishment consensus in favor of globalization that you were talking about w- was really shaking. And um, w- what interested us at the beginning of this project was to understand these different, these different critiques that were put forward by those in Europe, because we felt that some, uh, especially the left-wing critiques that we saw in, in Europe, um, proposed by, by NGOs and by labor unions but had, had very little in common necessarily with, with what was what Donald Trump was saying or that Brexiteers were, were arguing in the UK. And so, so the origin of this project was to try to, to take a step back from these very heated and very emotional debates and to try to understand um, what was actually the critique of globalization and how was the establishment reacting to it. And I guess I'll just add one thing to that. So thank you very much for having us on the show. It's really interesting to do this, particularly with the Asia Review of Books. And that's because this book really charts the major pushback that we've seen within the Western debates. But of course, the Western debates are not necessarily representative of the whole world. And I think you actually find different levels of pushback against economic globalization in different parts of the world. And I think there's still uh, a lot more enthusiasm about economic globalization in Asia than what we're actually seeing in some of the Western debates at the moment. And I think part of what's also led to this in the Western debates, um, even if it sort of came to a tipping point in that 2015, 2016, I think it, it traces some much longer term changes that were sort of building up over time, including things like the change in geopolitical power and economic power between 
the West and the rest or the US and China. And they're also part of the drivers behind uh, why we see the pushback and why it seems to be felt most acutely in the West at the moment. So the book talks about narratives of globalization. Um, and I guess kind of why why use that term in particular and why does understanding them as narratives, what does that help us as observers, as analysts to kind of understand about the politics of globalization? So um, I think we have to talk a little bit about our professional backgrounds here. So so neither of us is, is an economist. Uh, we are both trained in law um, and also a bit in social sciences. But we're not um, doing quantitative research. And so uh, what we were observing in the early reactions to the critiques of globalization was this very confident uh, dismissal of these uh, critiques by by what we call the economic establishment and the economics uh, profession in particular, essentially saying to to Trump and uh, to Trump and the Brexiteers, you, you're economically illiterate. You don't know what you're talking about. And uh, we felt that 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 was um, counterproductive and, and was not really moving us forward. But of course, we uh, didn't really want to confront, um, it was not so much that we wanted to confront the empirical arguments that the establishment was making. Our point was a broader one that that they that this is a broader debate that is not just about who's empirically right, it's also about uh, whose values do we hold and what, what, um, what, what kind of values do we hold, uh, what do we consider important. And that doesn't really um, it's not really that something that you can um, assess and discuss if you simply look at um, at empirical questions. You have to try to understand the broader stories that people are taking uh, are, are telling. We have to understand um, what people care about. And so it was a very deliberate decision uh, on our part to not say, okay, who's right about who wins and loses from globalization? That's not the question that we are asking. It was a decision to say, okay, what are the different narratives? that people are telling about um, globalization, because that allowed us to um, essentially put the empirical questions to the side uh, for a moment and actually ask, okay, see, what is the story that they're telling? What, what are the normative uh, preferences that are expressed here? What are the values that, that people hold? And talk about these different perspectives without necessarily um, getting into the empirical questions of who's right and who's wrong. Can I also just add on this that I think that one of the aspects of economic globalization is that it's a really complex phenomenon. It's very hard to get your head around it. And the way that people seek to understand complex phenomena is through simplifying stories. And the reality is that people often have different simplifying stories. And so even the question of what is the empirical test, so the economists had simplified the story that they told, and we, we will describe that in a second about the establishment narrative. And on some of the empirical questions in their simplified story, they were right, but their simplified story made certain assumptions that you could look primarily at economic gain, that you could look primarily at an aggregate national level, and that many of the challenging stories are challenged by looking at different levels of analysis or, or different units, be they sort of non-economic values or what happens when you look at um, the effects of trade, not on a national level, but on a disaggregated regional level. Many of those sort of um, ways that to push us to think and ask different questions empirically actually begin in different understandings of what is important and different stories. And so it's quite often the case that these are often kind of early warning signs about something that hasn't been fully considered because every single story tends to be partial and it directs your attention to certain things and not other things. And this is an early way that you start to access that multifaceted nature of a complex problem like globalization. So let's start with that establishment view. Um, what does it focus on and kind of what particular political grouping supported the established or maybe supported and still supports the establishment view of globalization? I think this would be a good one for Nicholas to start with, given his background at the WTO. Well, I would say the establishment view was essentially the the um, the view held by mainstream parties in most Western democracies uh, for the past uh, 20 years. And it's also the view that is supported by uh, by international institutions such as the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, that are the guardians of the international economic order. And they, the basic, uh, the gist of the argument that these um, institutions make is that globalization has the potential to make us all better off uh, because it increases the size of the pie. And then, yeah, they are tricky political questions about the, that pie is then divided, but uh, 
the basic truth is that we can all um, gain through um, international trade, uh, through rising productivity, through greater pres- uh, specialization. And, um, and if, if we accept that basic starting point, then it's a no-brainer that we have to eliminate obstacles to international trade, that we have to liberalize international um, trade and services and international financial uh, flows. The establishment narrative does recognize that in the short term, there will be losers. There will be losers in certain uh, locations, but it has a very um, clear message to those no- losers, and that is to adjust, right? And, and, and an important argument that you often see in publications that were put out, for example, by the World Trade Organization, the IMF and the World Bank after the election of Donald Trump is is this emphasis on first that that it's not just trade that is causing uh, disruptions, it's also technological change. And and the only sound answer is to to help people adjust uh, through active labor labor market policies uh, by bolstering um, the the safety net, um, the domestic loop. And there's another message here, um, which is more implicit than explicit, but which is that addressing these distributive concerns that arise from globalization is really a task for domestic policy. So it's, it's almost um, the international organizations bit, like throwing up their hands a little bit to saying that, well, it, we, we can't really do anything about it. Like if you mess up at the domestic level, uh, that's not really our fault. So the importance, uh, the importance, uh, the important thing that you have to do domestically is to make sure that the, that the pie um, is evenly distributed and that the losers get the support that will help them to be better off in the long term. And so then, after the establishment of you, kind of the everyone wins narrative, uh, you then kind of go down to the next set of narratives in your book, which is where the argument is not everyone wins. People lose, and they lose kind of permanently as opposed to a losing where they could be compensated. Um, And perhaps let's start with the left-wing and right-wing populist narratives of globalization, which you in your book say are distinct. Um, I guess in short, what, what makes them distinct? What divides these two narratives about globalization? Well, I guess the first uh, point to make about that is what what unites them and then what divides them. So we've used the word populism for both, and that's controversial. You could name them different things, but we're, in this one we've sort of named them by sl- their slightly sort of um, stronger figures on either side. And what they have in common with the populist agenda is an idea of a distrust for the elite. And so what Nicholas has just described is a very strong establishment position that was associated with the elite that sort of said free trade and economic globalization is a good thing and it's a good thing for everybody. And both of these are ones where there is a greater sense that there are the the masses that have been let down by the elite. And that's the sort of essence of the populist reaction. But the populist reaction is is different depending on its left wing and its right wing variation. So the left wing variation is really the one that's typified by or or sort of um, personified by some of the characters you said in your introduction, Sanders and AOC, also Elizabeth Warren, which really sees this as a vertical problem that the rich has pulled away ahead of the rest and it's hollowed out the middle class and and left a sort of a larger service class uh, below that's really struggling, the, the poor and the working class. And so they see it at what we would think of as sort of a, a vertical hostility of the elite having taken a disproportionate share of the winnings and not done the kind of redistribution that was assumed to happen in the establishment narrative. What we see in the right-wing populist narrative is something a bit different. They are also distrustful of the elite, but they are distrustful not because they say that the elite has amassed all the wealth and power to themselves, leaving these hourglass economies behind, but because the elite has failed to protect the domestic population and particularly the working class uh, population from an external threat. And here we we see this really personified by people like Trump, who really saw the, the, the people that had um, done the wrong thing here is that your jobs had been shipped from good manufacturing working class communities in America to places like Mexico and to China, which really benefited the uh, the workers in those countries, but at the expense of the workers in the developed states. And so there was a distrust of the feckless elite that had entered into the kind of trade deals that allowed that kind of offshoring of jobs to happen. 
But here, the, the major hostility is not so much just vertical, but is very strongly horizontal between different countries. And that also then ties in with an important cultural point that the, the left wing one tends to be much more of a sort of a, a cosmopolitan way in this together, whereas the right wing one is often associated not just with the concern about declining manufacturing and the Rust Belt and some sort of sense that uh, America or other countries like that have been ripped off and taken advantage of by countries like um, China and Mexico. But it's also not just about this sort of offshoring of jobs, but the onshoring of immigrants, because one of the ways that we see this happening very strongly, and this is not just in the US, but particularly strongly in Europe, is a concern about the onshoring of immigrants. And that can be for economic reasons of they might be coming to steal my job, or they might be uh, sitting on welfare and getting welfare benefits that have come from our community. But it, often underneath it is also a very strong cultural sense of wanting to stick to some sort of more uh, homogenous sort of ethnicity or to traditional cultural values or to traditional sort of community sort of rural values and that's something that's quite different to what you see in the in the left-wing critique. I should also say that there are different variations of the left-wing critique. Um, often on the Democrat side, there's much more of a sense of the problem is the 1% and we the 99% are together against the 1% which are the super billionaires. Whereas what bleeds into some of the, the more right-wing approach is a different divide, which is the 20% versus the 80%. That's often an educational divide, which says that, sure, the 1% may have done particularly well, but the very educated, college-educated classes have also done well in economic globalization. So I, I do want to get into some of the interesting intersections between these narratives, but we should probably explain your other narratives before we do that. So... Um, there, there are kind of two other narratives that kind of are in this kind of middle section where the where the differences between who wins, who loses um, are played out. And those are the corporate power narrative and the geoeconomic narrative. I wonder if you might kind of explain those before we kind of start getting to some of the interesting intersections in the politics. Great. I'll, I'll let Anthea talk about uh, the geoeconomic narrative where she has been, I think, one of the, uh, the, the most expert commentators. The corporate power narrative is, is is a tricky one because we've been, we've been criticized quite a bit um, that it's not that different from the left-wing uh, populist narrative. But we we do see a difference. And the difference is mainly that the corporate power narrative it take, takes a transnational perspective. And I just want to give you give you one example. If if we compare the critique of the offering of job that we of, of jobs that we hear from the from, from the likes of Donald Trump, that that is the, the image that Trump paints uh, is that the the developing countries are winning, whereas developed countries are losing, and particularly the workers in developed countries. The corporate power narrative tells a different story. It says, well, actually, it's it's workers in both countries, both in, develop, in developing countries, are losing, and it's the corporations that w are winning. And and the exhibit A for that, for that narrative is what happens to jobs when they are moved from developed countries to developing countries, because what they point out, what the narrative points out is that what was a good job with benefits and high wages in the developed country becomes a really low paying job in, in the developing country. And the surplus that is generated in the process is appropriated by the, by the corporation. Of course, the establishment response to that is often going to be, well, the workers in developing countries are less productive. And so the lower wages simply reflect their lower productivity. But if you look at, for example, Mexico, we see that since NAFTA was uh, concluded, productivity of Mexican workers has been rising consistently, whereas the real wages have actually not, not gone up. Right? And so that's, that's one of the, the clearest examples uh, that, that it's actually the corporations that are mostly benefiting from international trade and not so much the workers in developing countries. And that also leads to a very different perspectives about the kinds of politics uh, that we need in order to um, to respond to, to to globalization, and um, so so there's an attempt to ally workers in different countries to each other. So in, during the NAFTA renegotiations, we had Jerry Dias, the the boss of the Unifor Union, uh, traveling down to Mexico to say, "We are we are with you. We want you to have higher wages because then we are all going to be better off. You're going to be able to buy the cars that we produce." And so, so everybody's going to benefit. And so he was really emphasizing that the fight of the Canadian workers was not with the Mexican workers. It was, uh, they were collectively fighting against the, against the corporations. And so, yes, there are, of course, uh, strong parallels here to the left-wing populist narrative. But by, by bringing in this transnational dimension, 
we do see we do see a somewhat um, distinct features in this narrative. And I guess then I'll come in on the geoeconomic narrative. So I think um, if the corporate power is a bit more on the left side, the geoeconomic, I think, uh, started out a bit more on the right side. It was something that became much more prevalent through Trump, though it's one that I think has become a bit more bipartisan, particularly in the US and, and in increasingly in some other uh, Western countries as well. But to me, it's a very good illustration of the way in which your unit of analysis changes in the different narratives. So we've heard, for example, about the left-wing populist narrative, which has a unit of analysis of looking at sort of class. We've we've heard uh, with the corporate power one, where you look at like you focus in on corporations and how they may be the real beneficiaries here. And what you see in the geoeconomic narrative is a shift to thinking about sort of countries as a whole, but particularly thinking about great power competition because this has been very strongly driven originally by. Um, competition and rivalry between the US and China. And there what we see is that um, I think many in the US would say that both China and the US both gained from economic globalization in absolute terms, but that China has gained in proportional terms it much more, and it has used that to close the gap on the United States. And that's closing the gap economically. It's also closing the gap technologically. They've become much stronger technologically. And this is creating uh, geopolitical concerns and security and geostrategic concerns for the US. And so this is the narrative that you would start to see the pushback against major Chinese companies like Huawei and saying, no, there's there's a sort of a geopolitical or a security reason why we don't want to have Huawei in these different places. Um, it's what underscores the concern about uh, supply chain reliance on um, a strategic um, a competitor. So the US wanting to secure its supply chains to not be as heavily reliant on China. Um, it's what you see in the increase in investment screening, the use of um, security exceptions in trade. So it's got that strong geopolitical security inflection to it. So last but not least, there are six narratives. We've talked about five of them. And so I want to make sure we ask about the very last one, um, the global threats narrative, which uh, I think answers the question of who wins, who loses from globalization to uh, basically answer everyone loses. But could you kind of get into the this this final narrative and kind of complete your set of six and then we can start getting into some of the interesting intersections between them? Sure. So you're quite right. We almost think of it like a, a diamond. So you've got on top, you've got the win-win establishment narrative. In the middle layer, you've got the win-lose ones, but different ideas about who wins and who loses. And on the bottom, we've got this idea that maybe we all lose. And this one, people would know most strongly through probably the sustainability narrative, which is concerned about things like climate change. So at the same stage as you've seen through economic globalization um, and capitalism, you've seen this huge increase in productivity. We've also seen this huge increase in carbon emissions. And a lot of that has also been accelerated through economic globalization as some of the Western production and consumption uh, approaches have been spread around the world. And so the sustainability narrative says that actually we need to radically rethink our approach to our economies if we want to survive and thrive within the limits of our planet. And while the sustainability is the one that has been sort of around the most as an example of this global threat that we're all in this together and that our, our current ways of doing things are unsustainable, it's also been the basis of what you start to see in the, um, the COVID-19 situation where, again, we're starting to see a, a global threat, something that we're all in together to some extent, but um, it's one where it's it's exacerbated by economic globalization. And so you can see with the COVID-19 threat that the way in which it traveled throughout the world was very strongly based on physical movements of people flying between different countries and shipping, but also the supply chain shock that followed was very much one based on economic globalization. And here the narrative that we start to see coming out in response is not so much a sustainability narrative, but a resilience narrative, which is that we have become too interconnected with too many places, too many long taut efficient supply chains and so now what we need to do is recalibrate the balance and become more resilient. And so it's these sort of resilience and sustainability narratives that are really sort of saying that we're all in a boat together where we need to step back from our current approaches to our economies and our current approaches to economic globalization or else we're at risk that everybody will lose. So you can already start to see in kind of 
in explaining these narratives where there are alignments, where there are intersections. Um, I mean, obviously, for example, there are alignments between uh, left-wing populist and corporate power. There are alignments between right-wing populist and geoeconomic. Um, there are alignments in all over the place. Uh, it's also interesting to note where uh, you might not see intersections or where intersections are easier than those. For example, I think um, there's much more alignment between coming looking from the outside there seems to be more alignment between the two wings of the populist views in europe say than in the united states where i think there are other parts of those political wings that make alignments between these two sides more difficult namely i think as you note the more cosmopolitan immigrant friendly sides of the of u.s politics um but again i guess kind of add to ask a broad question how do you see these narratives intersect? How do they intersect differently in different places? And are and are there any kind of interesting examples of these intersections you've seen in kind of in developing this classification? So I think um, one of the ones that I found really interesting in doing this was that I had always assumed that the sustainability narrative was more of a left-wing narrative. And so I was used to places like the US where you would see something um, of, of a sort of the... the um, the New Deal approaches, the Green New Deal approaches, which really fuse some of your inequality concerns with your climate change concerns. And I think there's often an assumption in the US that um, the reaction of some of the, the right-wing approaches to climate change are reactions of climate denialism. And if, if only we could convince them of the science, then they will all come around and realize that we're all in this together and we, and we need to protect against it. One of the things I found really interesting in, in Europe was the overlap of some of the right-wing uh, populist approaches with the sustainability approaches. And so, for example, in Austria, you saw a, a coalition of the Green Party and the Conservative Party, so two different types of Conservative but in, in a different sort of way, where part of the underlying assumption is that actually if we want to protect against the planet or we want to protect where we are, we might need to throw up our borders in various ways in order to um, stop the flow of immigration and um, strike deals on climate change. And so I think that's a really interesting example of a kind of alliance that we haven't seen as much. The other place that we're seeing this at the moment is um, with the semiconductor shortage. And there we're seeing a really interesting overlap between a protectionist narrative that would say bring the manufacturing back home, a resilience narrative that would say make sure that your manufacturing is diversified across different countries so you don't have excessive reliance in a particular place, and a geoeconomic narrative that says make sure that you don't have reliance on your strategic competitor and so make sure that China is out of the um, out of the supply chains. And so all three of these overlap uh, with a sort of sense of the importance of doing more domestic manufacturing of semiconductors in places like the US, but they also split in various ways. So for example, the all the debates at the moment about ally shoring and whether or not you could create supply chains just among your allies, that sounds relatively good if you're in the resilience category or in the geoeconomic category because you're trying to get either greater resilience or resilience with your allies and cutting out China, but it doesn't sound good if your motivation is protectionist because you don't want good manufacturing jobs brought back to your allies. You want them brought back home to yourself, to your own country. And so by using these different narratives, we've started in various policy areas to think about where are their overlaps and where are their disconnects because they often give us a bit of a sense of where some po policy formations might happen or some alliances might happen going forward. I just wonder if I can um, add to that and to give a very concrete example. So trade is really one area where we see uh, lots of overlaps between the different narratives, which may, which might be quite quite surprising. But if you look at the United States, for example, um, trade policy is one of the area where we have a lot of uh, bipartisan uh, consensus. And just to to uh, give you a sense of how these narratives play out in in a particular negotiation, if we go back to the renegotiation of the NAFTA agreement. Under, under Trump, the Trump administration came in with a very strong demand that, that manufacturing jobs had to come back to the United States. And, and the way they wanted to implement that was by creating a requirement that 50% of any car uh, by value had to be made in the United States in order to qualify for duty-free entry into uh, the United States. That was, of course, that was something that was unacceptable for Mexico and for Canada. 
But what happened in the course of negotiation is that, that, that this requirement was changed in a way that made it acceptable to the proponents of the corporate power narrative. And the way it was changed was to say, instead of saying 50% of the car has to be made in the United States, um, it was changed to, to a requirement that uh, 40% of the car had to be made by workers making at least $16 an hour. And um, it's pretty clear why this suddenly became uh, more of a basis for consensus. But first, of course, it didn't exclude Canada anymore. Canada would also also has relatively high wages, so it would also be benefiting from this requirement. But even uh, organized labor in Mexico could tell a story well that this will give an incentive to companies to raise wages in Mexico, right? And so the it, it kind of married the the concerns of the protectionists, which was to, to bring back jobs to to the high wage countries, with the concern of the right of the corporate power narrative, which was to raise the wages of workers everywhere. And even though proponents of the protectionists and of the corporate power narratives may have agreed to that uh, that requirement for different reason, it provided a, a basis for consensus. And so this was a really interesting intersection between the narrative where an overlap provided the basis for such an incompletely theorized agreement between the, between the diff- proponents of different narratives. So I think a lot of our conversation about globalization kind of hinges around the conversation in Western countries, the United States and Europe, um, and Australia, New Zealand. Um, but I guess, do you have a sense of what non-Western societies are thinking about globalization? Um, do you see the same narratives come to the fore or maybe the balance between the narratives is, is different and kind of outside of, of Western countries? I mean, I, I note, for example, just to kind of bring in some examples here, um, it's true that globalization has been very helpful in terms of bringing up incomes, manufacturing, moving to Asia, um, but it's also true that, especially recently, uh, China has made a lot of noise about concerns about international influence affecting, you know, society, threats to changing the, I guess we can say like the character of society. So some of the same arguments are coming through in Asian politics as well when it comes to globalization. So I guess kind of we can have a, do you have a sense of kind of what, of how these narratives are playing out outside of the West? So this is a super interesting question. And and in fact, the last book I wrote was about whether international law was international. And it was particularly tracking the different approaches and understandings of different communities of international lawyers, including some in in decidedly outside the West in in China and Russia and some some within the West. And so it's something I'm quite acutely conscious of, that you often do get very different narratives coming up. We focused here on the Western debate because we saw that as being the place where there was the strongest pushback against economic globalization happening. But we see many of the same narratives also playing out in a variety of other countries. So you see the same uh, struggles between some of the sort of establishment uh, pro-economic globalization approaches in China and some of the left-wing ones that are are really concerned about the increase of inequality that's come and some of the security-based ones that are are worried about uh, US influence, particularly on anything to do with the internet. So you can definitely see within in other countries, some of these narratives playing out. But what we also thought was that within the Western debates, there were often what we called blind spots and biases, where um, certain narratives that had stronger traction in some other parts of the world either got less traction or were looked at from a different angle. So let me give you just two examples of those. Uh, The first example would be about blind spots. So I think a lot of the Western debates at the moment almost assume that the the, the losers of economic globalization are the, for example, uh, workers in manufacturing towns and uh, who have been sort of left behind. But of course, there's a much longer critique about economic globalization as being a a method of neocolonial power that first these Western countries uh, colonized and, and took many of the resources from places like Africa. And then even once colonization was finished, they effectively continued this through their transnational companies. So there's a long historical neo-colonial narrative that's much more critical. And you also have not just that some countries were sort of uh, sort of pillaged previously, but you also have some areas and some groups and some countries that feel like they've been very left behind by economic globalization. So the extraordinary rises we've seen in Asia are not matched by extraordinary rises so far in some parts of Africa, and we still have the bottom billion, for example. 
And I think that part of the narrative is is not a complete blind spot in the Western debates, but it hasn't got nearly as much attention. If you think about the elephant graph, for example, you don't see nearly as much focus on the tail of the elephant as you do on the trunk of the elephant, which is where the West is. But what we also see is in a variety of other ones, um, particularly when we're dealing with winners and losers, there are sort of two different sides to the story and different media um, environments privilege different sides of the story. So for example, uh, to pick up on the example that you had given, in the West, we, we would see that sort of strong right-wing protectionist of Rust Belt and communities having been left behind. That's the story of economic globalization and the redistribution of manufacturing told from the perspective of the loser of those jobs. But the Asia rising narrative and the rise of the middle class and the rise of living standards and the bringing people out of poverty that we see so strongly in the more positive approaches in Asia, that's actually telling the same story, but from the opposite perspective from the winners of that. And I think we can see something similar happening in the geoeconomic domain. So the geoeconomic domain takes a security threat from a rising China and sort of looks at Western responses to that. Whereas what we see, particularly from China and also from Russia, is uh, a similar concern, but but an against Western hegemony concern. So a concern that the West has been using some of their control over key nodes in the economy and have been weaponizing those. And so we can see that about the use of the internet, for example. And so China sort of balkanized itself with the internet much earlier. We can see that strongly with concerns about the US dollar and SWIFT and the way in which the US has been able to uh, use that. And so there we see not a kind of poor weak non-Western states, but actually some of the stronger non-Western states saying, we push back and we, we, we don't take this as being fair. And you're sort of securitizing this in a way, um, but that's because you yourself are sort of abusing your position. So we think you see, you see different things in, in different parts of the world, different uh, classes within different parts of the world, but also a different emphasis in the stories. The other thing though that you will see is that some of the movements that have happened since we finished the book have actually been kind of parallel in different uh, countries. So um, we've seen both the US and China increasingly develop their, their own geoeconomic narratives and increasingly move towards some technological bifurcation. But we've also seen both of them crack down on big tech, which is really a crackdown on corporate power. And so you're starting to see some really interesting configurations, I think, in China, where you've got some of this, not just of pushback against the US geoeconomic and anti-Western hegemony narratives, but a very strong attempt to try to redress some of the inequality and some of the corporate power. But interestingly, that is also overlaying with some of what I would think of as more cultural right-wing populist ideas, which aren't so much the anti-immigration ideas, but are about those sort of strong traditional values. And so at the same stage as we see kind of a pushback against big tech in China, we also see a pushback against like sissy boys and people like men not being manly. And that sort of sense of manliness is something that also comes through in your right-wing protectionist narrative. And it's an unusual alliance from, from a US perspective to see that kind of strong left-wing inequality with that sort of cultural right-wing anti-sissy boy aspect, uh, approach. If I just may add something to that. So we, we were acutely conscious of the fact that we, of course, uh, cover the Western perspectives much more in depth than the non-Western perspective. Though at, at one point when we submitted the book to the publisher, in fact, it actually had four chapters on um, on, on non-Western narratives. And we were then asked to, to, to cut down cut that down a bit. So it ended up becoming just one chapter, but there was a lot more research that we did on the non-Western narratives than is actually showing up in the book. And for me, what was particularly interesting, uh, looking particularly at Russia, was first that, of course, from Russia's perspective, the story of globalization is is a completely different one. The, the moment of the greatest triumph of the West um, in the early 1990s um, is, from Russia's perspective, the moment of, of tragedy, uh, not just not not primarily because of the end of communism, but because of the downfall of the of the Soviet Union, and suddenly you had um, the Soviet the state falling apart, um, as as Putin put it, um, hundreds of thousands of people waking up in 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 a foreign country, uh, and suddenly, and um, so so the starting point is a very different one, and then the experience of the nineteen nineties is essentially one that that the Western solutions don't work for Russia as well as, as they work in the rest in the West. 
and um, look if you look further at, at the at the Russian narrative, the the, the a core um, charge that's often leveled against the West is one of hypocrisy. So what's very what, what's striking um, to what was striking to us when we looked at, at Putin's speeches, but also of the writing of, of Russian political scientists was was this with this. Um, frustration that the West was promulgating all these rules and talking about the international rule of law. And then when it actually uh, was something that would have constrained the United States or, or Western countries, for example, in imposing sanctions, then it was just jettisoned and, and not um, not respected anymore. And so so this this charge of hypocrisy um, is is something that, that developed into, into a full-blown narrative against Western hegemony. Right? So it was an, an attempt to to establish an order which is no longer dominated by the West, and but we are fully conscious that in the book we don't fully develop that that narrative as much as it deserves to be developed, and so that's actually something for for a future project uh, potentially where we would have to obviously work with people who have a much better understanding of the of the local political systems and the and the local conversation than we than we do. And I just add one other thing there. You, you also see there are different types of globalization. And so, for example, um, the US, uh, some of the concerns at the moment are often about security or often about domestic workers. Um, one of the things that was quite striking in some of the research we did on some of the narratives we saw coming up in Africa was, was the level of focus on cultural globalization and that just the the cultural products from places like the US, um, whether it was Levi Jeans or um, Hollywood, would just engulf and overwhelm the, the local culture. And that's something that you just don't see as much concern about uh, in America because they're, they're on the strong side of that. And so I think it's another example that so globalization looks different to different people in different places because you have different experiences of that and also because you have a different relationship to the particular story. So I think I have kind of one more question before we wrap up our, our very interesting conversation. Um, I guess, what are some of the broader implications of your approach, um, you know, beyond just globalization kind of where, how does thinking about narratives allow us to understand other kind of complicated political problems? One thing that was striking in the converse, in, in in the process of writing the book is uh, the moment what was the moment when the COVID nineteen pandemic hit, because uh, what we observed at the time is that the narratives that we had been analyzing suddenly all became narratives about the pandemic, right? So the the left wing populist narrative had its prescription uh, for what should be done. For example, it said, well, well we, obviously now it's clear that we have to do more to provide health insurance to everyone and, and paid leave to everyone because otherwise it's a danger to society. The right-wing populists suddenly said, oh, of course, now it shows that we have to have borders. We have to close the borders in order to not let the, the virus come in. Right? Uh, the geoeconomic narrative said, oh, this proves our point that we can't depend on China uh, for personal protective equipment. So what, what was really interesting that is that we could almost predict the, the, the arguments that each of these narratives was going to make about this new uh, political, political problem. And I think it was also a really good example for us of what we think of as kaleidoscopic complexity. So I think of this project as on one level about being about economic globalization, but on another level, it is about how to understand and intervene in highly complex fields and economic globalization just being one example of that. And one of the things that this multi-perspective analysis trains you to do is to look at complex issues from different perspectives. And so when it came to the COVID one, not only were we sort of able to predict uh, what different ones were likely to say, but it meant that we were able to sort of see in the round from a more kaleidoscopic scope. We almost use the narratives to turn this particular issue from multiple directions and understand some of the different concerns that were likely to come up and in fact ended up it ended up coming up in the next 18 months after that. And so I think it can be a useful policy tool for sort of encouraging you to look at things from different perspectives. I also think it's a useful policy tool in terms of thinking about integrative policy making. 
So one of the things we've seen in the 20th century is a real push towards uh, dividing and disaggregating and to specialising. And we see this in the universities with different disciplinary departments. We see this in government with, with different departments with different subject matter focuses. And one of the things you really see with these complex problems is a collision of different uh, subject areas coming together, different actors, different approaches. You cannot understand them through a sim single subject matter focus. You cannot understand them through a single disciplinary focus. And this is something that we struggle to deal with both in a university context and also in a government context. And you can see this, for example, in the latest Economist, um, that the head trade person is really talking about how trade used to be seen as more isolated and now it's trade and climate, trade and security, trade and, and workers' rights, trade and all sorts of uh, um, other issues about the environment and, and various things. And she describes it as this complex mosaic. So this is really going to start to change the way in which we not only need to produce knowledge in universities, but also the way that we need to create more integrative approaches to policy making. And if you think of two or three of the big challenges that are facing us going forward, we have a huge challenge about climate change, which is inherently a wicked problem of this nature. We have a huge problem about geopolitical rivalry, which is also a highly complex problem. And we have a huge problem about sort of inequality in various different ways. And if you could imagine that all of those need these multi-perspective approaches and these integrative approaches, but what we're coming to is actually a collision of these different wicked uh, problems. I think one of the broader takeaways we take from the book is towards how do we think in these more uh, integrative ways, to how do we encourage greater synthesis, how do we engage in multiple perspective taking and try to understand differences so that we move away from not just some of the silos that we see in our current uh, workforce and our debates, but also some of the polarisation that we see in those to try and find better pathways forward. If I can add like a, fi a final comment to that, one of the really um, rewarding experiences of writing the book was that as we were looking into each narrative, we 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 started to see merit to some extent in each narrative. So we often ask, which is the narrative that you prefer? And the answer is, well, well, we may have certain sympathies and and find that certain narratives are more plausible, but we actually think there's truth in each of them, and none has the whole the whole truth. And so that that's something that that we highly recommend um, others to do as well as, as they confront these difficult uh, and complex problems, just put themselves into the shoes of, of their, their opponents. And even if they don't end up agreeing uh, with, with their perspective, it will give them, I think, a, we think a, a better understanding and a deeper appreciation for the underlying issues. And it also helps, as Anthea said, to hopefully overcome some of the uh, polarization. So they're both analytical as well as normative benefits for taking these different perspectives. You understand the complex uh, problem much better, but you also understand those who may be your opponents in the, in the debate much better. So with that, thank you for listening to our interview with Anthea Roberts and Nicholas Lamp, authors of Six Faces of Globalization, Who Wins, Who Loses, and Why It Matters. I do actually have one more question for the both of you. Um, and that is, uh, where can people find your work and what's next for you? Um, okay, where can people find our work? So um, I've put up information about this book and also other books on, on a personal website now, AntheaRoberts.com. Um, so you can find out more information there. In terms of what's next for me, um, I... I'm thinking very much about thinking about thinking. So the project I'm working on at the moment is called Thinking Global, which is actually what I was working on when this particular project came around. And it's it's about how do we think uh, not just about global issues, but how do we start to try and think in these more global ways? So I'm particularly interested in ideas uh, like complexity, in synthesis, in integration, but I'm also really interested in some of the underlying asymmetries of power about what sort of information gets out and what, what doesn't, and also some of the cross-border um, cross-border sort of intellectuals that I think are some of the most creative going forward. And when I say cross-border, I don't just mean cross-national borders. I also mean cross-disciplinary borders, cross-academic uh, practice divides. So I think that's the direction that I'm working in at the moment, a project of thinking global. And you can find my work on, on my webpage, which is essentially on, on my uh, 
on the Queen's Faculty of Law um, homepage. I have all my uh, my articles linked there, and most of my work until this project was about multilateral trade lawmaking. And that's also my my next project is to explore the implications of all these narratives for multilateral trade negotiation and the future of the World Trade Organization. And so, so one aspect that I'm focusing on is is the fact that these narratives bring new values into the trade space, uh, resilience, sustainability, preserving communities, addressing inequality. And the question that that we're all facing when we're thinking about the future of the multilateral trading system is, is this something that can be the subject of international negotiations? And we immediately see that there, there are real problems there. For example, many issues such as national security that, that countries are emphasizing much more often are regarded as, as non-negotiable. Um, Others are raised really difficult distributive questions, which which may um, cause countries to opt out of the, of the current rules. And we see that already with the United States and China, that the United States is pursuing its policy, trade policies against China, virtually completely outside the multilateral system. And others pose collective challenges, such as addressing climate change and as addressing for example, the supply chain disruptions um, caused by by the pandemic where, where um, WTO members really would have to work together in a way that they've never worked together before. And so the, the scope for tradition, for trade negotiations in the, the, in the way that they've traditionally been conducted is really has diminished quite a bit. And there's a real question of whether the WTO and the monetary trading system uh, more broadly will be able to address these questions in, in some kind of corporate fashion or whether we'll just see more unilateral action um, taken by, by WTO members to, to address these new priorities that they've identified. And this is an example of what we think of more broadly as governing in complexity. And we see this happening in trade, we see this happening in security, we see it happening in the environment. So you can follow me, Nicholas Gordon, on Twitter at Nick R. I. Gordon. That's N-I-C-K-R-I-G-O-R-D-O-N. You can go to AsianReviewOfBooks.com to find other reviews, essays, interviews, and excerpts. Follow on Facebook or on Twitter at Book Reviews Asia. That's reviews plural. And you can find countless other author interviews at the New Books Network at NewBooksNetwork.com. The Asian Review Books podcast is on all your favorite podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Rate us, recommend us, share us with your friends if you want to continue to support us interviewing those writing in, around, and about Asia. Next week, join us for an interview with Gershom Gorenberg, author of War of Shadows, Codebreakers, Spies, and the Secret Struggle to Drive the Nazis from the Middle East. But before then, thank you so much, Anthea and Nicholas, for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much, Nicholas. <laughs>